Hello, Terry here again. Um, today I'm going to show you how to prove that Euler's constant E is irrational. All right, first we're going to need a tool, uh, which I'm going to call it a lemma. It's one line proof, it's very straightforward. It basically says that any real irrational number, then the this reciprocal must also be uh, then this reciprocal must also be irrational. So how do you prove something like that? It's a one-line proof. Let x be irrational. Suppose the opposite is true, meaning suppose it's reciprocal 1 over x is rational. What does that mean? That means there are non-zero integers m and n, right? Positive integers, I should say, m and n, so that 1 over x is m divided by n. But if 1 over x is m divided by n, then x is going to be n divided by m. But wait a minute, n over m is rational, so that means x is rational. That's a contradiction, right? Because we start out by assuming x is irrational, you ended up with x being rational. That's a contradiction, and therefore, 1 over x must have been irrational in the first place. All right, so that's a one-line proof. Um, okay, so here's a reminder. In real analysis, right, you learn uh, something called the exponential function, e to the x. e to the x is defined by this infinite series of x to the k over k factorial, where k runs from 0 to infinity, with k fac 0 factorial defined as 1. So when you multiply this out, you know, you're going to get 1, or when you, I should say, when you expand this out, you're going to get 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. And since this is valid for every value of x, meaning no matter what value of x you put into this infinite series, in real analysis we prove that this exponential function is always finite. So, in particular, if you let x equal to 1, you're going to get Euler's constant, e or e to the 1, right? e to the 1 is the infamous, uh, is this very famous series uh, of 1 over k factorial, k1 from 0 to infinity. Uh, in the previous video, I have shown you how there are two ways to define e. One, you can define it as a limit. The other, you can define it like this as a series. And there, I, in that video, I proved to you that I show you how to prove uh, that those two are equivalent. So no matter which you know definition you use, you're going to end up in the same number called e. Okay, back to this exponential function. Since this is valid for any x, if I put in x equal to minus 1, you're going to get this alternating series, right? k running from 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the k over k factorial. Um, e, you know, e to the minus 1 obviously is 1 over e. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this infinite series, okay? And I'm going to show, from here I'm going to show that e to the minus 1 is actually irrational. And then we're going to use this lemma to show that if e to the minus 1 is irrational, then of course e must be irrational. How do we do that? So starting with this infinite series. Now remember, this infinite series says that you're going to sum from 0 to infinity in order to get e to the minus 1. So what happens if you stop somewhere in between and not go all the way to infinity? Well, what, do you do? what happens? So for example, let's say if I look at the sequence of partial sum, I'm going to start at I'm going to start at k equals 0, but I'm going to end at some odd integer, odd index, 2n minus 1 of the same thing. Now, of course, because in order to get to e to the minus 1, you need to sum to infinity. If you stop anywhere in between, you're not going to get e to the minus 1. So you're going to be off by a little bit. Well, how much am I going to be off by? Well, let's calculate the difference. So e to the minus 1 minus the, the true value e to the minus 1 minus wherever you stop. It's going to be this infinite series minus this finite sum. Right, which is going to be the remainder series. Okay, now the remainder series has the following. Notice because I deliberately stop at index, an odd index two n minus one, so that the remainder series is going to start at two n. Right, because previously you stop at two n minus one, you're going to start at two n. Okay, but notice this thing here. You have this alternating sign. Your minus one to the k. When k is starts at two n, two n being even. Right, because whatever n is, when you double it, it's going to be even. When k is even, minus 1 to an even number is, minus 1 raised to an even number is positive 1, right? So this term is always going to be stuck with positive. And so when k equals 2n, I'm going to get positive 1 over 2n factorial. Then it alternates again, minus 1 over 2n factorial, 2n plus 1 factorial, plus 1 over 2n plus 2 factorial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now look at this. Every term here has a factor of 2n factorial, right? Because 2n plus 1 factorial is 2n plus 1 times. 2n factorial. So every term here has 2n factorial as a factor. So I'm going to pull them out. Factor 1 over 2n factorial out. This term is going to be 1 and a minus 1 over 2n plus 1. And 2n plus 2, remember, is 2n plus 1. Sorry, 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 times 2n factorial. After you pull out, you're going to get this, and so on. Every term is going to get 2n factorial. Now let's examine this expression. Let's call it expression 1. 
Expression one tells us a couple of things. You see this difference here, right? This difference is made of two terms. It are made of two factors, sorry, two factors. It's one over two n factorial and this square bracket factor. Now, one over two n factorial is pretty obviously positive, right? n starts from one, two, three, and so on. This thing is always going to be positive, right? More important, this thing is also going to be lesser than or equal to half. <coughs> because one over two n factorial, right? n starting from, from, uh, from one, you're going to get one half. When n is 2, you're going to get 1 fourth, and it gets smaller and smaller from there on. So this is bounded above by 1 half. But what about this square bracket? We don't know what's happening in this square bracket. Now, what we want to do is we want to show that this square bracket is actually between 0 and 1. <coughs> Excuse me. How do we prove that? We're going to prove this square bracket is between 0 and 1. First, let's prove that this square bracket is positive. Now, that's easy to do because of the following reason. You see, this infinite series, we were told, right? We, we, we learned this in real analysis that this infinite series is finite, right? It will add up to some finite number, whatever it is, a finite number. Now, this is a finite sum. So when you subtract a finite sum from a finite series, you're going to get a finite series, right? This is an infinite series. This is a finite sum. When you subtract a finite sum from a finite series, you're going to get a finite series. So in other words, this remainder series is finite, meaning these, this expression number one is finite. Now, the expression one is made of this coefficient, which is obviously finite, so we can ignore that. So, so in other words, the point is, this square bracket is a finite series. Whatever it is, it's finite. Okay, because precisely this series is finite, remember one of the, um, the benefits you get from working with a finite series is you can group them any way you want. Right? Because as long as it's finite series, you can group any way you want, it's fine. So let me go ahead and group them like this. I want to first show that this is a series greater than zero. And the way you show that is group them by the first two terms, third and fourth term, right? Uh, uh, fifth and sixth term, and so on. You group them by two. Now within each square bracket, notice what's happening. One is always greater than one over two n plus one. Remember, because n starts from one, right? One, two, three, four, and so on. Every n value you put in here, Right? 1 minus 1 over 2n plus 1 is positive. Similarly, uh, this second square bracket, you can clearly see why. This, the, this, sec, this square bracket has two fractions. The first fraction is 1 over 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 2. The second fraction is basically the first fraction. You see that? It's basically the first fraction, except you're further dividing by 2n plus 3. That makes the second fraction smaller than the first fraction. So what happens when you subtract a smaller fraction from a larger fraction? The result is positive. So in other words, the first square bracket is positive. The second square bracket is positive. In fact, you can check every single square bracket group like this is going to be positive. When you add up a bunch of positive number, is going to be positive. So we have now established that this expression clearly is greater than zero. Okay, how do I show that it's less than one? It's very similar. I can group them any way I want. So this time I'm going to group the second and the third term. So notice I start with one. So leave it out, out there as, as follow. And now watch what happens. When I, because this is a minus and because this is actually a positive. So you need to be careful. So when you factor a minus out, you're going to get 1 over 2n plus 1 minus a 1 over 2n plus 1, 2n plus 2, right? Because this minus and this minus makes it positive again. So when you subtract like that, clearly you can always get, end up getting something like this. Now watch what happened. Same same logic. In this first square bracket, right, there are two fractions. The second fraction is basically the first fraction, except you further divide it by 2n plus 2. So that makes the second fraction smaller than the first fraction. So in other words, this first square bracket is positive. Similarly, look at this fraction and this fraction, right? The second fraction here, once again, is exactly the first fraction, except you further divide it by 2n plus 4. That makes the second fraction smaller than the first fraction. And therefore, this square bracket, too, is positive. All right, so what happened is you can clearly see that every square bracket is positive. But don't forget, in front of every square bracket has a minus sign. So what that means is you keep subtracting a bunch of tiny but positive number from 1. You're going to get something less than 1, right? So we now have established that this expression, right, Whatever is inside the square bracket is between 0 and 1. Strictly greater than 0, strictly less than 1. Okay, this is important because now look at this expression again, right? This, 
the, the, the difference, this remainder series is going to be a positive number times a number between 0 and 1. What happens when you multiply any positive number by something between 0 and 1? You shrink it, you make it even smaller. So therefore, I know this remainder series is strictly positive, right? Because we have established this thing is strictly positive. So when you take a positive number times a positive number, the result is this thing is positive. So in other words, we have now shown wherever you stop, as long as you stop at some odd index, the difference is this partial sum is always going to be less than e to the minus 1. This is very important. So in other words, this remainder series is always going to be positive, right? All right. So now that we have established this thing is positive, this remainder series is positive, and more important, because you multiply by something that is between 0 and 1, you're shrinking that to be less than 1 over 2n factorial. So in other words, this series is actually strictly between 0, greater than 0, right, and strictly less than 1 over 2n factorial. So what if I multiply 2n minus 1 factorial across this inequality? What do I get? The left-hand side, 0 times anything stays 0, right? This in the middle is just 2n minus 1 factorial times this remainder series. And the right-hand side is going to be 2n minus 1 factorial over 2n factorial. But 2n factorial is 2n times 2n minus 1 factorial. 2n minus 1 factorial, 2n minus 1 factorial cancel. All you have is 1 over 2n. Now, 1 over 2n, remember n is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Even when n is 1, is 1 half. When n is 2, it's already 1 fourth. So in other words, no matter what n you put in, this is at most 1 half. All right? So in other words, we have now shown this remainder series, when multiplied by 2n minus 1 factorial, is still going to be strictly less than or equal to 1 half. I mean, not strictly, but less than or equal to 1 half, right? Let's call this expression 2. Now, remember, this expression 2 says this is true. No matter what n you put in, small n, medium n, large n, super large n, it doesn't matter. It's always true. Okay, now we're going to finish the proof. Let's follow. All right. So starting with 2n minus 1, you notice something. If I expand out 2n minus 1, right, 1 minus 1 plus a half minus a 1 over a 6 and so on. You notice because it always n on the odd number. So I know the sign for the last term is always negative. This is always true, right? And because it's always negative like this, right? So if you simplify, you can, you can, 1 minus 1 is gone, right? So you start with 1 half minus 1 6, right? Plus 1 24, etc all the way to 1 over 2n minus 1 factorial, whatever n you choose, is going to end like that. What, what happened then? If I multiply 2n minus 1 factorial across, right, what's going to happen is you're going to end up having something like this. Uh, you're going to multiply the first term, the first fraction, by 2n minus 1 factorial, you're going to get this. The second uh, t fraction by 2n minus 1 factorial, you're going to get this. Now watch what happened. This 2n minus 1 factorial will include 2 factorial, as long as n is big enough, right? They will always include 2 factorial. So in other words, this first fraction, there is a 2 factorial up here somewhere. It will cancel with the 2 factorial in the bottom. That makes this first fraction actually an integer. This is actually an integer, right? A positive integer, in fact. Similarly, if n is large enough, then this thing is also, excuse me, going to be an integer. Why is that? Because 2n minus 1 factorial will include 3 factorial somewhere in there if n is large enough. So that makes this also an integer. One integer minus another integer, which is bigger. Well, clearly the first must be bigger. The reason is because the first is divided by 2 factorial. The second one is divided by 3 factorial. So that makes this integer smaller than this integer. But however, because you end at minus 1, it depends on how large n is. But let's say we're going to pick n large enough to make this whole expression right? A positive integer. In other words, I can always make, two, I can find n large enough, 2n minus 1 factorial times s sub 2n minus 1 is going to be a positive integer. You can clearly see that I can make n large enough to make it so. All right, now we're going to wrap up the proof. The last step of the proof is we want to show e to the minus 1 is irrational. How do you do that? Well, suppose, it's op suppose the opposite is true, meaning suppose e to the minus 1 is rational. Okay, under this assumption, e to the minus 1 is rational, what does that mean? That means I can always find positive integer p and q, so that e to the minus 1 is p over q. But now, because this p and q are fixed, they're constant, right? So I can make n so large to make sure that 
you know, two n minus one factorial times e n minus one is also a positive integer. How do I know that? Well, let's take n equal q plus one for example. If n is q plus one for example, then two n minus one factorial is going to be two q plus one factorial. Surely, two q plus one factorial is bigger than q. So that means this whole thing is going to be, right? So p, right, multiplied by p over q multiplied by two q plus one factorial. Surely, it's going to be a positive integer. So in other words, I can pick n large enough. Right, so that 2n minus 1 factorial times e n minus 1 is also a positive integer. So now if you pick n large enough so that both will be positive integer, then there's something interesting is going to happen. If this is going to be positive integer, this is going to be a positive integer. When you subtract them, right, you're going to get a positive integer minus a positive integer. Okay? However, look what happened. We have already established something to be true. Looking back at this expression, right, we already said that e to the minus one minus s of two and minus one is positive. This is positive, right? And so if you look at this expression, right, this is this thing times a positive number. So all of these, this whole thing is going to be positive. And so what that means is, if this is going to be made a positive integer, right? Uh, sorry, if this is going to yeah, if this is going to make it be a positive integer, this whole thing is going to be positive. Now, but if this thing is a integer and is positive, it cannot be zero. That's what positive means, right? It cannot be zero. So that means at the minimum, it's going to start at one. Correct? So you think about it. If I can make this a positive integer, this a positive integer, when I subtract them, I'm going to get this. And I've already established that this is positive. And if this is positive, and this is always positive, Positive times positive is positive. So that means this must be a positive integer. That means it cannot be zero, right? That's what positive integer means. So that means at the minimum, it's going to start from one. So in other words, I have now established this expression is going to be greater than or equal to one. But wait a minute, that's a problem. That cannot be true because that contradicts two. What did two say? Two says no matter what n you choose, this thing is always less than or equal to half. How can you have something that's lesser than or equal to a half at the same time, greater than or equal to one? That's a contradiction. So what that means is your assumption e to the minus one is rational must have been wrong. And therefore we conclude that e to the minus one must have been irrational in the first place. Okay, if e to the minus one is irrational by the first lemma we have shown here, then one over e minus one, meaning e, right? So e is going to be 1 over e to the minus 1. And if this guy here is irrational, it's reciprocal by the lemma, it's also irrational. And this proves that e is irrational. And that's the proof. Uh, I hope this is helpful. Uh, thank you for watching.